the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Transform our hearts and our lives into following in all we do. May we serve you and please you and come to know you better through these discussions of this time together. We entrust this time to you the hands of our mother as we say, Hail Mary, mm-hmm. full of mm-hmm. grace, mm-hmm. the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We started talking last time about God and about sin and God's response to sin. That God is not mocked, therefore, there is a point in which God is not going to pretend that, that people are going to come back and is going to put a stop to that. <coughs> that there is a time when God will stop you. That was kind of trash. There's no one in the kitchen. There is no one in the kitchen. Okay, so you This is a work of a real rabbit. <laughs> God will stop you. Well, can okay, we look at the fact that once we forgive God, God, God has our life in mind, that even death itself is for three reasons. It's a natural consequence. It's just part of nature. The punishment for sin is also a mercy. So God will stop you. There'll be a time when people aren't going to repent anymore. God will, God will stop you entirely. God will, God will prevent them. And the saints in war now so there's a number of sins which we commit beyond which the Lord won't forgive anymore. Not because God's not being merciful, but because there comes a point that we just not for that. Uh, we're just making the world worse. Because for God to draw, 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 draw his grace. God's anger is not like our anger. It's not an emotion, it's not losing his cool, it's not losing his temper. It's, it's God is so good his, that the response of the Lord to evil is analogous to the way we would think of it. Um, it's a consequence and the response is because he's so good. It's never for our evil, it's always for our benefit. God has two kinds of providence. Providence, think of the word provide, is God providing and God caring for the world, for the universe, and for men. And of course, first for men because this is why the Lord made the world in the first place. There's two kinds of providence. For those who fear God, for those who seek God, all works for their good. So for the saints, any suffering, any punishment, how they come home Look at Job. Uh, the, the suffering of Job made him a greater person, a better man, a better trust to God. The, the death of the saints brought them to hell. When people rejected them, or mocked them, or scorned them, they lost something, it worked for their good. Any blessings for their good, any, any, everything was for their good. For those who are for their good. But for those who reject God, if you reject God, It won't be for your own good, but for the good of those who follow God. Thomas Aquinas, commenting upon this, it's one of the Psalms, I believe it's Psalm 39, I believe, um, says that uh, by sin, we choose, people choose to live by 
If, if I'm sinning, I'm choosing to live my pleasure here on earth. For food, for, clo for clothing, for warmth, for power, for money, for gold. I'm basically choosing to live like an animal, right? The animal's life ends here. Doesn't have, the goal is not going to be to have it returning to God as the suffers are. And so the life of an animal isn't about going to heaven. It's not about um, seeking happiness for eternity. But it's to help us. The animal exists here on this earth for our sake. The animal exists this year for us. What this means is that the Lord the cares for the animal doing so in the end for our sake. And so for those who reject God, those who, those who want to live like animals, who don't want to live for heaven for eternity, those who want to live for life here on earth, the Lord will say, fine, I'll give you your choice, I'll give you your option, you can live that way as you choose to. That was your request, your desire, and uh, you did live that way. But that means that I'm going to treat you as nice. I'm going to give you the direction. You wish to be an animal, I want to treat you. And therefore, my, my providence won't be for your good, but for the good of those who follow me. In other words, literally, if I'm going to be an animal, the Lord will say, okay, here you go. I'm going to live for your life here on earth. You want to live for blessings here on earth? Well, I'll give you those blessings. But the ant's not going to be much good because you're going to be miserable. This helps understand what's happening in Noah's flock. What's happening with the ark. So first of all, the Lord is getting to a point. And, and so you have evil grows. Evil begins to grow and grow and grow. After Canaan. The point where the Lord intervenes, where, where enough is enough. First of all, there's a warning. 120 years, no warning. So second of all, this is the last ch chance of those who are caught in the flood Still can, can call upon God and repent. You know, this is, you know, this is their last, final call from God. You're about to die. This is a big flood. Turn to repent. And third of all, they decide no longer wants to be the one of their own good anymore. And so now their suffering is now a warning for everybody else. It now purifies and repents. Not because God's anger, not because God's angry the way we are, because the boss's temper can't stand us anymore. Even though that's how it's described in the scriptures. That that's an analogy, that that's a poetic way of saying it. But because God's not going to be mocked about their evil in the end. This is 529. Noah has his vocation that when he's first born. Noah is with this call from God. Vest tells me for five, it's going through the generations, genealogy. And Lamech, in an old age, begets a son and named him Noah, saying, Out of the very ground one was put under his curse. This one, Noah, should bring us relief from our work and toil of our hands. So Noah is either the savior or newer at the beginning. Lamech, his father, at the very beginning of his birth, recognizes there is a location here, that there is a prophecy. Where Noah is going to renew and heal and begin, begin the earth again. And he does so through the flood. The thought, of course, prefigures a few things. Mm -hmm. Another story, I'm not going to go through the story in detail, that there is the flood of 40 days, and there's another 180 days where the boat before he the back of land. He takes all of the actors and creatures, um, Two of every clean, seven of every clean, seven of every clean, two, 
the Ramtinat. The purpose of saving and redeeming and renewing. The flood prefigures back. It points to the renewal that happens when we're about. <clears throat> First of all, there is a death month. There's a washing away of those things that are sinful, the corruption. There is a banishing of what's wrong. And there is a new life. This is a holy beginning where the human race is kind of begun again. From the eight people on the ark. Death and life through water. And of course there is the wood of the ark. And you even have here in a hidden way sacrifice running through us. <clears throat> because you have here more clean animals or unclean animals being taken to the ark. Why? For, for food, first of all. But also for sacrifice. The very end of the story of Noah and the flood, Noah for sacrifice. And thanksgiving Recognition for what's going on. You have a several of a sacrifice, and the Lord sees no sacrifice and makes a promise. And ever again, with this kind of flood, we we'll never have this kind of thing. That this is the only time that ever knew, knew the earth life. I can destroy the earth life ever again. And so there is salvation and promise then through sacrifice, through blood. You have already been appointed then to Christ's cross. Where Christ dies, Christ has his blood, Christ has with the cross, is coming there to baptize, to redeem, to save, and to renew. And you also have the beginning of being shown. Man works with God. For salvation. <clears throat> See, God could have built the ark himself. For Adam and Eve, God gave them their clothes. God gave them um, their hat when they left the garden. God clothed them. Cain and Abel, God would be right. With Noah, God says, You work with me. You build the ark. You do this house. You call the animals. I'll help you. I'll wait till everything's ready. I, I will call the animals to you. I'll work miracles for you. But you build the ark. Labor in your hands. See, back in the garden, man's vocation, man's work was to work with God. Part of being the, the child of God, the son of God, was to work with God to fill the soil, to care for the animals, to work with each other. It's for harmony to talk about. And what God's showing us. Because you're showing us we need to lose this. We need to lose part of our vocation or maybe to our part of being the children of God. As part of this renewal, God showing us He wants us to work with our vocation for our, for our salvation. And our salvation, salvation of the entire human race. Right, so you know what? Let us work and save himself. Noah us say the entire human race. Without Noah and the ark, there's no crime. There's no us. And so Noah, by his work, saves his family, saves his descendants, saves everybody else. That's why he's this prophet from the beginning when he's born, he's going to be renewing and saving and redeeming. And so again, put yourself in the mindset of the people when Moses wrote this, when we saw this the first time, you're hearing them from God is you have a job to do. You have a task to do. You have a share in the salvation and the redemption and the cleansing of the earth. And so when you're given your task and your duties to a prayer, a sacrifice, a work with God, it's not simply the 
the Lord, you know, there's Solomon saying, you know, I do this, this, work, this work. It's the Lord saying, work with me and help me save the world. Work with me and help me redeem the human race. That's what I'm talking about. Just here, no, we are. It's not just don't make God mad. It's not like the Hulk. Not like the Hulk. We're not going to make angry. <laughs> the message is there is salvation and renewal, and the Lord wants to save us. The Lord wants to save us. He wants us to work with Him and help Him in that salvation, which is pretty incredible. <coughs> So he takes these broken, sinful people. He says, work with me and save. Work with me and save. Again, we can talk a little more about this more in detail with us. But any questions on this for God Abraham? I have a quick question. Yes, yes. How did people live to be like 500 years <laughs> old? <laughs> Every time I read the Bible, I'm like, yeah. how? So there's a couple different theories. And one theory is simply this is poetic license. This is analogy. This is a description of um, virtue. That when it says that the 900 or 800, it simply means they're really virtuous. That it was a idiom that would have understood at the time the people was written. We've kind of forgotten what it means. But this means virtue, virtue. And so because, because we're age was, was, a, was a respectful thing. Unlike these days, not the kids. <laughs> you know, the older you were, the more respect you had. The more virtuous you were, the more wise you were. And so, so, so one theory is this simply it is a poetic way of saying you're wise. Um, and so certain cultures of the time, that, that was the case. And so you have kings being supposed to that to live 30,000 years. You know, yeah. um, which clearly is not <laughs> literal. This is not a yeah. Yeah. 595 years after Noah was born. Right. <laughs> 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 and, and, and so I, I one first. kind of wish it was still a little more like that because like you get to this age and you're like, I'd make a great mom if I started right now. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, for real. True. <laughs> Not all those mistakes I made all of them. Yeah. Unfortunately, the problem I feel is what am I doing? I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the, that's, the, that's the dumb part. The only thing you start doing it, you do it right. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so one theory is simply that this is a symbolic one, right? Because age equals wisdom. And so you're, you're wise, you're virtuous, you're, you're holy. One theory. The other theory is that this is, is the after effects of the, the Garden of Eden. That there still is some of that, that life that I can see. According to Thomas Aquinas, and this is this this is this is a theory that's not um, this is not this theory. The tree of life was something that wasn't you eat the fruit one time and then you live forever. Be, because there was going to be a transition phase. There was going to be something that had to be continual. If you notice, God does not don't eat the tree of life. God didn't eat. So presumably they're eating that tree. And so according to Thomas Aquinas, that tree of life. <coughs> Did that make you immortal in the sense you never die? That made you possible for you not to die? What, what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it preserved your life. It made you live long and healthy. It almost ate of it, you just keep living, you keep, 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 keep your body and soul together. It was this natural fruit that made you healthy and strong and vibrant. And so it really didn't have any mediums until they sinned and created the garden. And so one theory, this is some of the after effects of the tree of life. Um, and, and so that basically when, when God stole the tree of life, what they had to do with yet was that they don't need him anymore. And so this was the end of it. It's, but but, but that, some of that virtue, some of that life, the vibrancy, passed on to the sentence for a little bit. And then with the with Noah kind of ended. So we're going to see shorter and shorter lifespans. Um, so both theories, I think, are good. I think both theories are fine to believe. I don't think either one really affects the story a whole lot. Um, yeah, I just was curious. I, I but it's interesting. Uh, so the uh, well, 
What kind of the map does actually we come to Melchizedek? So Melchizedek is the figure that kind of pops out of nowhere in scripture. And one theory is that he is Shem, uh, one of Noah's sons. Mm-hmm. Even though it's because it says he lives in the right before Abraham. So there, there's well sometimes he goes back a little too much. <laughs> 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 but, but I would say I don't know if those theories are, 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 are good. Either it's a literal number, and, and there's because of the, the life still from the garden, or it's a poetic number that, that everyone would have understood the time we kind of forgot and look and say, what are you talking about? You know, it's like in 2,000 years, if you just say, I feel like a million bucks, you know, what is that? <laughs> What's a buck? <laughs> What's a million of them? <laughs> Maybe come up with some weird theories about that too. Can I, can I just make a quick Please. observation? Please. So something that like I feel like God helped me to understand recently is that, and it's so beautiful, is that not only are we called to participate in salvation, we're also called to participate in creation. Yeah. And so like when you look at really healthy societies, they have that architecture and the art and the just the beautiful creations that people make and so even in our own little way if we like build a garden or we you know have a potted plant that we're taking care of or we you know um paint or color or draw or knit or whatever build anything we're participating in creation yes and then making it better like bringing heaven on earth like we say in the lord's prayer well, I talked about this in our first class because that is often part of my anticipation. Yeah. Uh, and something that's a very, it's a very key point. You don't get, you don't get that point. You don't understand why the Lord has the sacraments, why the Lord has us uh, have a church, why the Lord has us you know, raise children, why the Lord has us. It's, really, it's key to our vocation. Uh, that the Lord has us participate in His creation and work with Him in His love and His life. That, that this ability of man to work with God. Is key to who we are as human beings, um, and that, that the Lord becomes the redeemer, so that we can place us, He sanctifies and restores the ability to work with Him. So, absolutely, that is a great insight. But I, I personally think it's, it's key to our vocation. Um, uh, um, Scott Hahn has centered his theories around covenant. Um, if I were to write a book, I would do it around that point. It would be where we're meant to help God with His creation as part of our vocation as human beings. Um, not that I'm a star hot, but <laughs> I'm up here. <laughs> I can't pen it. <laughs> Any other questions? Let's go on to Abraham. Then. Abraham is the father. And obviously, we're going to be kind of skipping some things and jumping around, and, um, but cover the camp. A couple things to know. First of all, as I said, before, I said last time, you'll see throughout the scripture the shepherd thing. And Abraham's a shepherd. Abraham very clearly is a shepherd. We, we have all, all, but many of the great figures of these and prophets will test them are shepherds. Abraham is one of them. In Genesis 12 and Genesis 13, we have the call of Abraham. And it's something that is really important to think about and pay attention to. Let me just look at Genesis chapter 12 real quick. Let's look at both of them. There are a couple of verses here. Genesis 12, 1 to 4. See, you have a genealogy, again, at the Tower of Babel. Then you have this. The Lord said to Abram, Go forth from the land of your kinsfolk and your father's house, so that I will show you. I'll make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I'll make your name great, but you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. All the communities of the earth find blessing in you. I will grant the Lord directed him along with him. Genesis chapter 13, 14 to 8. 
The Lord said to Abraham, look about you from where you are, gates to the north and south, east and west. All the land that you, that you see, I will give to you with your descendants forever. Um, we can note here, St. Paul says in Hebrews, this should be descendant, singular, not plural. So, translation, Philippian Iron. I will make your descendants like the dust of the earth, your descendants' tomb might, might be counted. Set forth and walk about the land, to supply the breath of your hue, I will give it. And Abraham moved his tents and the thought of the Lord. Abram's call. You talked that. I don't keep forgetting it. <laughs> Abram's call. A couple of important things to notice here. Abram's given this role to be kind of he's the, the father of, of monotheism. Um, so, so the because of sin, because of confusion, because of man's stupidity. We get to fall into pagans. Um, it's interesting if you look at a lot of the religions that are polytheistic, the Greeks, the Romans, the Hindus, the Americans, you can discover closely as many of the, the, these religions do believe in one chief god, who have a and then many, many other lesser ones. As the first class, they focused on the lesser ones. But above them all, even above Jupiter, there is one chief god who in all of but then they're focused on that because he's too great. So they, they, they look at and pay attention to, and they, they, their religion focuses on, on lesser beings. It's interesting. And that there is this, behind everything else, that there is a monotheism. Um, Aristotle, writing in the 4th century BC, is originally the Greeks and the Romans were all monotheists. And then it was, it was too much for them to worship God that way, and so it was easy, it was easy for themselves, they fell in these myths so much. And that's a pagan speaking. Um, but you kind of fell with this, this, this polytheism, this many gods. Abraham becomes the founder of polytheism, given this promise. But notice, where does this call begin? Does Abraham look for God, search for God, say, Lord, help me and save me? No. Does Abraham, you know, try to figure this out and study hard? No. Begins with God looking for Abraham. The call begins with God. See, all too often in our spiritual life, we focus on our part. We focus on our I did this and finally the Lord responded. I was fully hard and find the Lord of mercy on me. I pray and sacrifice that the Lord saved me. Don't be spoon the star with ourselves. Those are scripture, this, 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 this theme, this resounding theme. People got called, most of them are not looking for the to be back home. There are some exceptions. In those cases, it's not that they were out there saying, Lord, here I am, Lord, Lord, you know. I'm here to serve you. Lord, I purify myself and I'm ready for you. The Lord comes and picks them and says, you come follow me. It's quite this to the apostles. Do not choose me, I chose you. And I'm to go and bear fruit. God works first. God calls first. God work is, is the one who is beginning our salvation. Our salvation, our journey toward God, doesn't begin with us. Not that we came and looked for God and said, fine, I guess I'll let you. I guess I'll see you. I guess you. It's God's coming to us. God's saying, I want you. I love you. Come to me. That longs for us. <clears throat> if you look at it, so if Adam and Eve, it begins with God created. And then we found. Then God came and said, what are you doing? We thought, I don't know, you know, they're faulty. <laughs> well, it's okay. Here's what you did to yourself. But there's salvation. Savior. And then comes Noah. And Noah's by himself. And Noah says, Noah, the living ark. It's okay. Then comes the tower of Babel. We said again, Noah there was Abraham, the father of nations. Abraham is okay. 
David's called from the sheepfold. The prophets are called from the various tasks. You know, if you look, it begins with God. God is the main player, the main mover. Moses. It's just that Moses was not out there trying to save his people. Moses ran away into the desert, to Midian. And God calls him and says, go and save my people. It's something Moses is very familiar with. And so begin looking at these scriptures and realize that what we're being told is God begins this call. God begins salvation. God desires to be saved. God is not being grudging and saying, fine, I guess this is enough. God is saying, I long for this. And I've come to find you and pull you out before you're out. To save you before you let yourself to do this for you. He said, I'm going to make a name. I'm, I'm willing to say, I'm going to make a name. And look at this. This is a theme throughout Scripture. Throughout the rest of, of the Scripture, there are classes together. Look for this. Attention to this. Notice this. God calls for us. So, so from this class, two things to look at the rest of our time. Shepherds. And God calls for us. Direct. All throughout Scripture. New Testament included. These are really running through that. These are really thread on that. Comments on that before we go on? Polytheism? Yeah, is that, is that the same as um, pantheism? No. So, okay. two Greek term words. <clears throat> They're related but not the same. So, poly means many, a polygon has many sides, right. many gods. Pan means all. Oh. So pantheism is everything is God. I'm God, oh, you're God, right. you know, trees are God. Right. The God in me comes out the God in you. <laughs> you're the God of the me and the God in you us together. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always found interesting yeah. is that um, various cultures all over the world have these uh, flood mythologies. Mm -hmm. and, and you, Most that came from the you know, human beings spread out and yep. still remember. And there's evidence there was a great flood, geological evidence. No, we found flood, flood stories in something in the Americas, mm -hmm. in China, and Japan, and Greece, and the yeah. Most cultures have some big flood story, what kind of Noah's Ark story. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's very fascinating. Um, it's also very fascinating to look at DNA DNA evidence. Um, how it is to be by DNA, all the human beings in the world are more closely related to each other than all the chimpanzees in one forest in Africa. One forest in Africa is more diversely by DNA than all the human beings in the world. Wow. So when you touch on that, yeah. how do you reconcile with some of what science has found where history goes back 2.5 million years versus what's addressed in the Bible. Yeah. So, so the Bible doesn't give times and days that we do. Um, what it does do is it, it does fit in with DNA evidence because it, what it says is that we came from one man or a woman, but scientifically, the man is we, we, we don't back so far. The man is many, many, many thousands of years, millions of years after the woman. Eve. Then Noah. Right? I mean, it, from Noah, we, we only go back to one man. And then we, he still has those three wives. The son of those have those three wives. It actually fits the sign of the other. Um, historically speaking, the different geological ages and, and times, um, the scripture was not written to be a history book. Um, and so, Scripture. First of all, the Bible is not um, make sure it says very careful as long as it should. The Bible is written for a purpose. 
And it's not saying these are the only generations. It's not so, so it's possible there are gaps between some, some, of, some of these generations. It's possible that some of these things are poetic. Not all of them. Some of them have to be in place. And it's possible that some of these things are... Um, it's possible science is wrong, too. <laughs> but... Um, so this question of how to reconcile science and evolution and the Bible, I, I don't think they're as far apart as people think they are. I think they think they speak about two two very different things. Um, if I were to describe yours and Tara's wedding day as a poet or as a chronologer. That description would be very, very different, right? Historically speaking, I would have happened on this day, at this hour, at this time. Um, these things happened, and that was all. If I was like, a poet, I would try to tell your story, story to your kids, your grandkids, or whatever. I would focus on that stuff. I, it's, this is what you know, Tara wore. This is what you know, Daniel felt like. This is what happened. This, this was the joy they felt. And that would be the focus of the emphasis. They're not, they're not, they're two different, it's not that they're, they're opposite or that, hey, aha, look at that, didn't say that, uh, you know, it said, it said Daniel felt like it was the best day of his life, and we know it's not true because another day was even happier. This, this must be false. You know? I know they thought after that, you know, this, you know and, and so it's, it's not, it's not that, that these things are real or, or science or, or accurate, it's speaking to a different part of one. With different angle, with different emphasis, um, and it goes it goes back to the point we made at the very beginning, where if God had written the scriptures as a scientific analysis, no one could read it. Um, no one understand it. If it was simply a pure history book, it's simply chron a, a chronological explanation what happened perfectly exactly would make sense to us. Um, it's what the Lord does, he tells stories. And it's, and it's not to say, because these, not that these stories are false or unimportant or irrelevant. And nor is that the science is irrelevant or false. It's that there's a different point here. It's not that they're not true, it's not, not, not that they're not able to reconcile, it's that there's a different emphasis. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, but scientifically speaking, I, I, I do think, at least from what I've seen, and <laughs> it's possible that my Problem with my, my science I would say, <laughs> at this point. But what I've seen in, in my studies, um, it matched up to me. So I, I was at anything that I looked at as a man, does this science make some sense? points to an uh, intelligent design. You know, that, uh, I think that this is this Nico sometime. And look at the simple atom, simple cell. It's, it's just so immensely complex. Mm -hmm. and just, not have happened randomly in mind. But, but even, the, even the history and the, the DNA and, and the millions of years, I, I think actually does match up quite well to what we know and what the scripture says. I think it does match up. Yeah, it does show um, people originated from a, a location in Africa and then, and then spread out and they, they've traced this with this. Uh, and we're all related to one man and one woman. Mm -hmm. And, we go from the yeah. and the mitochondrial DNA and and you can trace back from them further back from the map, which would make sense. You'll know when the flood and Adam and Eve. And to um, me, dinosaurs, all of that, that doesn't contradict God's plan. I mean, it was all part, I mean, there's just all these immense creatures you read in Genesis about these huge creatures that were in the ocean. And it's like, it'd be interesting to go back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, if there's one thing we're going to go back. Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Seem like it was, um, uh, you know, man locked, but there's underground caves and there's like a giant octopus that goes through those, like, giant. And yeah, there's still stuff like that. Alligators. <laughs> well, yeah, we looked at the ocean and the skies. Look at an orphish. Is there some, some interesting creature called the orphish? The sea serpent. But we don't call it, it's a 40 foot long creature that's about 
this wide and it looks like this snake has this, this crest upon its back and you know it's this like this, this bald eel thing but it's an orifice, it's not a seizure. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at the description of a picture of it and I didn't know what the difference I would say yeah it's a seizure. Uh -huh. But it's this, this 40 foot long ribbon like creature that's you know about this wide looks like a snake and swims in the water yeah. Normally found deep on the earth, but it's deep in the sea when it's popped to the surface. Yeah, that's so I mean, so five years, you know, a sailor and a machina. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you see dinosaur bones, but yeah, that's right. <laughs> some of those, some, some of them are are, are, are but kind of silly. Um, there, there is a theory that I can subscribe to, whatever it's worth. <laughs> 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 If you ever look at a, uh, a woolly mammoth stone and a skeleton, um, the the place where the trunk goes, the muscles are looks like the eye. I've seen that. You yeah. Seen that? The, the skeleton it actually looks almost like, like a man's skeleton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A certain angle, and yeah. so it's the cyclops. It's like um, <laughs> and there are certain places in Europe where they found these woolly mammoth skeletons have this tradition there that are built by cyclops. Yeah. So you can see someone, you know, some person in the ancient world digging there, and oh look, there's this giant man here. <laughs> <laughs> Solves everything. <laughs> but it's not that people were dumb back then. It was just different information. Different information, and you know, yep. how, how, how many times have our own theories in the last ten years changed? Oh yeah. You know, in, this in the last year. The last year. <laughs> <laughs> totally not totally back. Not. Is weather good for you? Is weather, right. yeah. Or is right. it? And, and, and 50 years from laughing, I say, what idiots those people were back in 2020. Well, now I'm seeing Helen's changed carbon dating. Like the, the Mount St. Helen's uh, eruption showed that carbon dating really wasn't as accurate as they thought it yeah. was. Yeah. Um, we found weird things where it's against some of the rock formations. We, we found rock hammers and little rocks that we know were were in the 1880s. You know, but they were found in the middle, middle of limestone, boulders. And so, I had a time machine that went back in the <laughs> years, some of these rocks from a lot quicker in certain certain, certain circumstances. <laughs> wow. But, I think we found like a fluke, we found a kind of watch, like a pocket watch and a rock too. And really? <laughs> yeah, but the things that we found in rocks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure why they would choose to name these pocket watches. <laughs> Just a mess of us. Stupid humans. What a practical joke. Yeah. <laughs> that is <laughs> In the middle of Abraham's story, and again, I'm, I'm just kind of punching highlights. We can spend, you know, again, years talking about Abraham. There is this interesting figure of Melchizedek. Abraham, Abraham, Abraham at this point, um, Genesis chapter 14, he's been called by God, he leaves his, his people, begins worshiping the wrong God. He forms a covenant with five other nations, and they go and they defeat another. Sorry, he's still, still out on this point, sorry. Not your hand yet. And he goes with other kings, including the king of Sodom. Interestingly enough, before Sodom was destroyed. Um, so th th there's these fight to war was wars. And then he comes back as victory. Genesis chapter 14. Now the that king of Salem brought up bread and wine. And being a priest of God Most High, he blessed Abraham with these words. Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, the creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God the Most High, to live with your foes into your hand. Abraham gave him a tent of everything. And then you hear from him again. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's an pops up and disappears. He's an important figure for a couple reasons. One is one of the Psalms describes Melchizedek, well, the priesthood of the Messiah. As descending from Melchizedek. It's a figure because Abram ties to him. So the chief, the head, the greatest, the first, 
right? So in, in Jewish culture, you know, the father had the power and authority over the son, but the grandfather had power and authority over the father and the son as well. So the, the further back you were, the first group to group that it would be done. And so the father of the Jewish people is tithing and then blessing from Melchizedek. This is a really cool dude. <laughs> this guy's important. Right, this guy's a big deal. Who is it? He's a king. He's a priest. And he is the king and priest of the city that becomes Jerusalem. King of Salem. Salem means peace. This becomes, in the future ages, Jerusalem, which means city of. So it's, it's this, over the over age time, it changes and becomes Jerusalem, which is Salem. Melchizedek, his name means king of righteousness. And he's pretty much mentioned every Mass, isn't he? Yes. Isn't that where the priesthood comes from? Well, so, I yes. Like, I mean, I know it comes from yeah. Jesus. Right. Yeah. yeah. The Order of Melchizedek. So, Christ is the King, the Order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110. Let me read you Psalm 110 real quick for the section of Psalm 110. So, Psalm 110. The Lord says to you, my Lord, this is God talking to the Messiah. So this is the one point um, in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Christ asked the Pharisees, how is it that David calls the Messiah his Lord and the Messiah is David's son? The answer, of course, is that the Messiah is also David's God. And the Lord said, my Lord, the Lord says to the Messiah, take your throne with the right hand and you make your enemies your footstool. The Lord has sworn the sentence, but it will not change. Like Melchizedek, you are a priest forever. So he's a priest who offers bread and wine. <coughs> like the mass. Um, he blesses Abraham. He's not a Jew, he's not one of these people. But the priesthood is truly serving the Most High God. And here then, the reason why uh, the Messiah had the priesthood of, of Melchizedek, not of, not of Abraham, but of Moses. Moses' priesthood, the Aaron's priesthood, comes through physical descent. If you were the son of Aaron, you were a priest. If you were a son of the bigger family, you could be a Levite. So my family were Levites. We could, have, we could be a priest. If I was at the time of Christ, I would be a deacon. Or I suppose it would be, or, or God. I, I could live in, and till the soil and not act as a servant of the temple. If I was serving the temple, I'd, I'd be a deacon. I couldn't be a priest. I couldn't be a priest. I couldn't be, I certainly couldn't be a high priest. Most of the priests couldn't be a high priest. Only a certain family could be a high priest. If you had the tribe, you had the bigger tribe, the Levites, the particular uh, group, even priests, and then a smaller group, even the high priests. It was, it was to the children, the physical descent. If Christ comes along, he's not the son of Aaron. He's not of the tribe of Levi. He's a higher, deeper, better priesthood, just like Melchizedek. Like Melchizedek, he, come, he comes from nowhere and has always been there. <laughs> and Melchizedek, uh, he's the priest of the Most High God. He offers bread and wine. He offers for himself and the King of Christ. And blesses all the descendants. The other thing you notice here too then, Melchizedek is not Jewish. Abraham has promised all the world will be blessed in your name. This is true because the Messiah Christ comes from Abraham. But Abraham himself is but the son who's not Jewish. <coughs> and so we have here then the God is telling us, I'm going to call not just one nation, one tribe, but I'm going to call the entire world. 
So we have here the seeds, the beginning of the Lord beginning his plan to save everybody. Not just one nation, not just one tribe, not just one people. But the entire world is part of God's plan of salvation. An important part of God's plan of salvation. Going back into God's call, God's desire to bring everyone to him. God's desire to love us all and to save us. We're all meant to be saved by God. He wants to be as we all with him. Um, with Melchizedek, one theory is that he's shed. He wanted Noah's sons. You know, that he was serving as, but that's, that's, that, 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 that's a good speculation. Uh, it's, it's a good theory. You know, it d- does fit the timeline of what he says, the ages he would have been around and the times been around, but there's not really much proof for it. No, but, but this is where the argument told, though, is there is, is this, this, this plan of God for all people to himself. Where he begins by having, where there's this man who is not part of this plan of salvation, who yet is, who is a true priest of God, not, not, a, not a pagan priest. And the Messiah is like. If he wasn't pagan or Jewish, what was he considered? He was a priest of like God. He was someone else. <laughs> he, was, he was someone else who God had called to rid himself. But he's not part. Of, he's, not, he's not part of this, the main story. So his children don't form part of the salvation, except in so far as he loves Abraham. Oh, and becomes a model for the Messiah. So I, I'm confused. Please. How is he related to Abraham? Like how in the story? Like where did it... Abraham goes and has a baby? And then he comes, he is the war. Okay. He fights a war. This, and then he then one of out of Salem comes this priest, who's the king, who blesses him, and Abraham ties to him. And this figure is so important that the scripture later on in the Psalms talk about the Messiah as receiving his priesthood. Of being a king, Messiah knows is the son of David, a king, and the priest of the Most High God receives the priest of Aaron and Melchizedek. Not the physical descent, not through the promise of Abraham, but through the call of God. Part. Uh, and, and, so, and so he becomes this this figure of Jesus, where God calls him differently than everybody else. God comes to make his bed privately, somehow. And they're going to appoint a priest, a real priest, while there's no sacraments, bread and wine. Who knows God and loves God and serves God. Who's righteous and just, but not Jewish. And that's all we know about him? We don't know. <laughs> we have four verses. That's it. God, I gotta know what happens <laughs> <laughs> This little library at Alexandria may have had some more books, but. (laughs) (laughs) And for these four verses, it's a really important thing. (laughs) (laughs) That's crazy, but yeah, at least we got that one. But but he's not part of the main history in the sense of, see, most of the history here, recently we focus on what we have here. Is this because this is this we have story we have here, the story of Jesus Christ family. Abraham is the father of Jesus Christ. He's like not. From Abraham's descendants comes the savior of the whole human race. Doesn't mean that so this is this is the ordinary new salvation. Abraham and you know this this plan. But God's God's awesome. <laughs> And there are ways and times that God works beyond that our knowledge and God reveals people through the building. Um, there's some interesting stories and there's all kinds of theories and who knows what happened. If you look at there's an Egyptian pharaoh. Um, what's the guy's name? Shoot. Okay. Can I think it's not Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I did report on him. Did you? Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I was like, come, good guess. <laughs> But uh, yes, so he's this, I mean, there's the pagan culture, and all of a sudden, for some reason, we get said there's only one God, and we have to worship the true and true God, and so there's, there's not many gods but one God, and, and those who worship other gods beside God is, are, 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 are 
wicked and, and, and they're offending God. He wants to reform you know, society and culture to follow the Ten Commandments and, and then he's put in his people about the roles and they kill, kill them again. <laughs> Where'd that come from? Did, did, did he meet a Jew a Jew of Paul and stuff somewhere making birth? Who knows? Did he have a revelation of God? Maybe. Did people like Saul is never startled? You know, kind of figure it out in philosophy. You know, and so God is always plenty of always calling people, always telling people to come to him. But the main story is Christ. <laughs> but the Lord is not bound by There's an interesting story. Look up at one point, look at Venom of Mary Aguila. That's a fascinating story. Um, over in Texas, the missionaries of the 16th century, 17th century, uh, went to preach. And they found there was a tribe there near the cabin. Never seen a white man before in their life. But knew the Baltimore cabin. Knew the Baltimore cabin. They knew the cabin. The cabin, the cabin, the cabin, the cabin. And when I asked about it, I said, well, well yes, the, the woman in blue preached to us. And we're, we're waiting for the, for the priest to come and to give the sacrament. And, and then they went and they found there was this Carmelite nun. I don't know what Carmelite is, but she was a big, 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 big in Spain. Uh, who was bilocating and preaching, never left Spain, but could describe in detail the places that, that, uh, in Texas, um, and was able to give like, names and people and stuff, and uh, bilocating, <laughs> was bilocating, was able to preach to the people, the people that were listening, they were more, more, more Catholics, waiting for the priest to show up finally. But the Lord prepared them for this, you know, earlier. Wow. Um, we look at some of the Aztec myths and legends where they're waiting you know, for the, the Savior to come. Yeah. And then, then when Cortez comes, they confuse him with some of these things. So the Lord plans these. Yeah. This is the, the Bible story, the main Bible story of Jesus. That's why we, this is good we're going to our Lord and how we were saved. But God is not bound by it. We're bound by this. God is not. But we do have the point that is that there is this it's called everybody. God, God is calling everybody. And nobody's going to be able to stand for God and say, Lord, you didn't tell me enough. You didn't give me enough. I didn't know enough. You know, you failed me. It's all your fault. Everybody is, has the chance to know to be saved and to come from God. If, if we don't come to Him, it's our own fault, not our own. Um, comments, questions? I mean, this is, this is, this is, <laughs> because that's so much time on <laughs> but you get the Abraham. We'll see if we can. <laughs> if we can, it's always better. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on then to Abraham and the couple. God calls Abraham. Abraham leaves his people and his family. Lives life for himself. And then God makes a covenant. And us, this is like, okay, whatever. The people of the time, this is a big common deal. We call it. <laughs> the covenant was made between nations and families, between kings. So a covenant would happen if there was a marriage, or if there was a treaty, or if there was some kind of important thing that united peoples together. The way the covenant worked, and the covenant that God established with Abraham it follows a pattern, again, it would have been very familiar to people at the time, it would have been very, very well known. But God takes the culture, and God, the way it works is you take the animals, and you slaughter them. And you divide them, and you walk between them. So you have this, this cow, this sheep, these goats, they're bloody and gory, and it's cut by the fire, walk between them. What you're saying is we are bound close together is this animal. This animal, and it was one, and it was torn apart, it was killed. And we're now so close to the night together that us being separated by war, by anger, by any, any way, is like this animal being killed. Right? If we separate, it's like tearing us apart. It's like tearing, it's tearing me in half. Because we're so closely together. God was a covenant with man. 
Yeah. Abraham doesn't come to God and say, God, let's have this covenant. Prove to me that me, me that we're close. God says, Abraham, do this, I'll give you a covenant. You serve me, you love me, you follow me alone, I will be the descendant, I will give you a son, I'll make you a great nation. We're going to be one. God is a covenant with man. This should be mind blowing to us. God is come to man and say to man, okay, now you're mine. You serve me or else. No, the son of man says, the son of man, I love you and I'm just helping help you because you go, because I'm in a mess. God says, I want to be one with you. I want to be united to you forever. Was to be joined together as flesh and bone. And of course, in the end, God does become flesh and bone, and unite to us in the Eucharist, receive him, body, blood, soul, and divinity. This is a big deal. It's not simply, again, we hear God become, but Abraham, all the while, kind of go, okay, cool, isn't that nice? This should be something that we understand the union that God desires for us. The love God has for us, the call God has, it didn't just be with me forever, it's been with me. This is why we have this part of description the union between God and man described as a marriage. Where in certain books of the Bible, the New Testament, describes this union as a divinization, man becoming God. Especially important Eastern theology. This covenant with God and man is something so real and visceral, it's something tangible. It begins in the, the symbolic way in his animals, but it ends with Christ becoming man and in his flesh and blood redeeming us and feeding us with his body, his blood, his soul, and his divinity. It begins this covenant of Abraham being shown by God is care for us and his desire. And the case is gone. Genesis 15, chapter 1, or verse 1. Sometime after these events, the monkey's neck, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield, I'll make your reward great. And Abraham said, But Lord, I don't have any children. None of these do me any good, not having any children. The word of the Lord came to him and said, No, and the eyes of your steward shall not be your heir. I will give you a son. He took him outside and said, Look up the sky and count the stars if you can, just so shall your descendants be. Abraham put his faith in the Lord and to credit his faith to him as an act of righteousness. He said, I said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of the earth Chaldees to give you this land as a possession. Well, God, Abraham asked, how am I to know that I shall possess it? Meaning my children, my family. He answered him, bring me as a three-year-old heifer, three-year-old goat, a turtle dove, or his animals. So we just need this cup. Let's get on to verse 13. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Though certain descendants shall be aliens in this land and off their own, they shall be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. Israel and Egypt. I will be upon those in the end of the part of the great wealth. The sun had set and it was dark, there appeared a smoking brazier and a flaming torch to pass between these pieces. In that occasion, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Descendants, I will give this land. One of Egypt, the river of the Euphrates. And all these other places. Abraham wants to know, but will I have my child? And God says, Trust me, I'm going to give you a son, and he covenant with you to give you a son. He's promising here not just Isaac, he's promising Jesus. He's promising our Savior. Questions on this? Come on, okay. Let's move forward to the Oak of Mama. Yeah. 
Genesis 18. Years pass. Abraham waits. Abraham waits. Mm. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the terebinth of Mamre. Oh, terebinth, different translates. Some big three. Oh, exactly. Yes. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's one of those Hebrew words that we don't really know exactly what the word is, and so it's translated in various ways in different people. Mm. Well, the day was going on. Looking up, he saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran from the end to the tent and reached them. And bowed over the ground. And he said, Sir, if I ask you this favor, please do not go on past your servant. And he gives him, um, he feeds him, and they, they, they send him away. Let me skip on forward to chapter 10, or verse 9, excuse me, same chapter. One of them said, I'm sure to return to you about this time next year. And Sarah will then have a son. Sarah's listening to the tent, the tent is behind him. Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced years. And Sarah spoke having her periods. But Sarah laughed at herself and said, As I'm so withered, my husband is so old, why did I still have a child? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, So I still bear, bear, bear a child as old as I am? Is there anything too marvelous for the Lord to do? Abraham's waiting by 20 years at this point. How many? About 25. All right, so, if you're coming, and he waits for 25 years, then God appears to him in the form of three men. And you have the hint the Trinity here. And the three men are there, we have one man speaking, and the Lord speaking, and so it, it, it's. Um, that God joined the tools, but there's a hint of the truth. See, God has a plan beyond human comprehension and purpose. Let's move forward, and then you finally have the birth of Isaac in Genesis chapter 21, verse 1 to 6. Um, so, again, more things happen between that and the very promise, again, and then he has to wait some more. As this chapter 21. The Lord took note of Sarah as he had said he would. He had first he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore Abraham a son in his old age. The set time God had stayed. Abraham gave the same name to Isaac, to the son of his, whom Sarah bore him. Abraham was 100 years old when I was born to him. Sarah then said, God has given me cause to laugh. I will appear to laugh with me. Isaac means laughter. And so both Abraham and Sarah laugh when they hear his promise of God. Mm -hmm. Abraham laughs earlier. Sarah laughs with tremendous. And now she's laughing not, not with you no know, surprise, this can't happen, it's impossible. Now she's laughing with joy. Isaac means laughter and joy. What you're saying, everyone hears will rejoice with them, will laugh. The point of this, right? I mean, if you would stand for like, like, what's God doing? God's taken Abraham, he's been faithful to him and the covenant with him, promised him these things. Abraham needs hope. And God says, Don't want me to come with me. Abraham believes him. Then time passes. And more time passes. And more time passes. Abraham is already over. And, be, and all of a sudden, there's no more hope. And more time passes still. What's being shown to us here is God's salvation is coming from humanity. It's not simply that Abraham and Sarah were this great couple and were able to have children and they raised their kids the right way and that's why they're saved. God intervenes. God saves mankind. God works miracles. We're being told here salvation is from God. Now obviously, Abraham and Sarah have rolled it. They've helped them, they've been faithful, they've assisted us. But salvation comes outside of ordinary human intervention. 
Salvation comes from miracles. God is trustworthy and faithful. Even when we think He's not. Even when we think He's lame. Even when we think that God is failing us. Even when we think that God has not long answered our prayers. God has planned something better and greater and more important. God is there taking care of us. God is there redeeming us. God is there working for our salvation, our redemption, and our life. So Abraham's been waiting for 25 years. He's given up hope. Sarah gave up hope. Sarah said, you know, first Abraham was going to give everything to the steward, one of the servants, so he's our. And God says, no, you have a son yourself. And Sarah says, Father, this isn't, isn't going to happen, so why do you why do you have a child with, 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 with my and my This will be your own son. It won't be for me, but it will be your, your son. And God says, no. Take care of it. They both do it hope. God intervenes. And then, as is 22, God says, sacrifice your son. This has been the great hope of Abraham. He's waited his entire life. <coughs> He's an old man now. And God says, sacrifice I Offer him up. Kill him. Give him back to him. This was something that was common in the, to the culture. You would, uh, uh, this expression of love and devotion for the gods, give up the best you had. That would be your hope. And so God says, give me your son. We've waited for us, the only child, for 25 years waiting. Finally happened. And God says, and now it's 30 years later, God's a sacrifice or something. This is a test. This is quite a test. Ready me. Do you trust that, that this is going to be, to be the father of revelation? Do you trust that this is going to be the redemption? Trust, trust me. God's asking. At the same time, the Lord has promised He's going to take care of him, He's going to play the children for him. He's going to go back. So Abraham goes out to Mount Moriah. The three days journey. And Isaac carries the wood on his back. Does anyone know where Mamariah is? Has it gets a new name? Gethsemane? Close. Or I mean, um, Calvary. Calvary. Yeah. Calvary. Mamariah is Calvary. It's a new name that later on becomes Zion. Portion of that, that is Calvary. The same amount where Christ walks up carrying his wood of sacrifice. It's an uncle. Three days journey, three days in the tomb. Become the sacrifice of age of redemption. St. Paul, talking about this, says that basically Abraham is referring also to a resurrection. Where Abraham believes that somehow, you know, God will give Abraham as a back to him. It'll be a resurrection of new life. So you point that in eternity to him. Otherwise, this is a great test. But on the way there, Isaac, his son, 13 year old son, says to Abraham, his father, Father, I see the wood, I see the knife, where is the sacrifice? <laughs> and Abraham says, God will provide. Guess what God's provided? God will provide the sacrifice, my son. And they go out, and before Abraham is killed, they bind his son, and he gets his right to kill him. And God stops him and says, You gave me everything back in your heart. I don't want you to do the sacrifice that he kind of can attack us from anymore. And I'm going to advise for you if you instead this, this ram, sheep, called a thorn bush by his horse. God agrees by the sacrifice. What he's doing is he's saying us, telling us here, 
God is on the death of any human being once our life. Who does God provide to give us life? Jesus Christ. Abraham simply has to offer his son, not go through it. God gives his son and goes through it. God substitutes himself, this ram, this sacrifice, caught the thorns, the kind of thorns. He's become the sacrifice of man, giving us life, giving us resurrection, giving us redemption. As much as man gives, God always gives more. God asks for our faith and fidelity, our trust, and God fills up a promise with his life. God wants our salvation and our life and gives us more than we can imagine. And so when Abraham says, God provides a sacrifice, he's thinking of Isaac. Maybe he has some hope from the happen. But God has used these words with deeper meaning and deeper purpose and saying, yes, I'm going to provide a ram here and my son on the cross. I'm going to provide in a covenant this human God, man, my son, my beloved son. And they're being told here that God's always faithful, wait for his promises, God will provide, God will intervene, God will redeem. Even things are hopeless in human standards, God is there redeeming and saving and protecting and giving us life. And that's a really important thing to hold on to. It's a really important thing to remember and hold fast to. This is the story of your life. God provides a sacrifice that redeems us himself. And the sacrifice thing is carried out by the history of the Eucharist Mass. Questions on this? No, I'll kind of off real quick. I'm going to get my hand for the evening. Um, any questions on this? I went through a lot really quickly all of a sudden. Sorry. What happened to Ishmael? Ishmael is banished from the, uh, um, the territory, but then becomes a great man as a woman. He becomes also the father of 12 tribes, 12 nations, um, but they're wild tribes. Um, Tradition, according to tradition, um, they become um, the Bedouin, who then become Muslims. So that the Muslims trace their their, their descent through Abraham to Ishmael. Um, but the scripture says that he is uh, a great king as on right with, with twelve nations in fact. Because even, even though it's not direct promise to Abraham, he still is still that promise of blessing him. It was Abraham blessing him. Um, so again, we're being told here, again, there's a couple of important things to recognize here. Right? So God calls first. God works first. God seeks life. Even death is not the end. Death is the mercy of candy. There's resurrection life after this, and God wants to be nigh to us so closely as the moment. See these stories building each other? See these stories, you're going to keep adding on to these things, and you have to keep building on and grabbing on to them before you kind of put them together? And then we're going to get Moses, no, probably Joseph next time. We'll see if we get to finish that from Moses. We'll see God begins to intervene personally as a personal relationship. See, now there's supposed to be simply that this kind of big arc, big stories, this big, this big family drama is to be a personal relationship and union with God. Where God interests in our sorrows and our joys. That's what God is. That's what the are being told here by the scriptures. Questions, comments? Let's close with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time together. Help us to understand what you have given us, and the truths you have taught us. We will live them out in our lives, and we serve you and be with you forever and eternity. May all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world without end.
without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.